My name is Richard Samuel Diet. I was born in Darby, Pennsylvania at the Fitzgerald Mercy Hospital on April the 30th, 1936 at 2.30 in the morning to James Diet and Mary Alice Price Diet, my mother and father. And we lived at 2611 McDade Boulevard in Holmes, Pennsylvania, which is a Taco Bell right now, where the house was. And we lived across the street from <coughs> a wholesale florist company that was, uh, they had a bunch of warehouse or uh, greenhouses. And my father worked there when I was growing up. He started there as a carpenter building uh, workbenches and benches that the uh, flowers were grown on. They grow uh, a bunch of sansevieries, which are also known as uh, mother-in-law's tongue. They're very popular in the East Coast because they're green all the time and they're an indoor plant. And my father worked there from, uh, he worked there for many years and then one day the uh, one of the drivers to deliver a load of flowers to New York either was sick or didn't come in. So my dad took the truck to New York. And when he got there, he was told by Duncan McCaw, he was the owner of the, the uh, flower shop or the wholesale florist. And he says it's cash on delivery, no checks. This is in the probably around 19... 34, 35. And so my dad's in New York. Communication wasn't really good. You didn't have, you didn't have pay phones on every corner. So he didn't know what to do. So he figured he could take the truckload of flowers. And he went down to the uh, wholesale flower market and he dropped the tailgate on the truck and started setting out his flowers and they were buying them and paying for them. And, and a man came up to him and he says he was dressed to the nines. He had spats on, which are white covers around your ankles and feet. And he looked at the load of flowers and he says, uh, don't sell any more. He says, I'll take the whole load. And my dad says, well, it's cash only. He says, no problem. And he said, he gave him a dress to go to and I was down on Fifth Avenue in New York. And when he when he headed back home, he had over three thousand dollars in cash, and this is in you know the thirties, and that's a lot of money. I mean, that's probably about two years' wages for an average labor. So when he got back to uh, Holmes, Duncan McCaw took the money and said, uh, James, go home, get cleaned up, get some rest. And he says, well, load the truck and you can go back and do it again. And after that, he became a salesman for the wholesale florist. My uncle Samuel was the younger brother of my father. There was five boys in the family. Robert was the oldest one. Alexander was next, who died when he was about 30 years old. Then my father, James then Samuel, and then his younger brother was Charles. Samuel, he went down to apply, and he told his, his mother and father when he, when he left the farm, he went down, he says, if I don't come back, he says, I've been accepted to the Royal Ulster Constabulary in uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, he didn't come back that day, so he went to work for the police department, which was called the constabulary at that time. And they would go out and they would have a barracks in different parts of the country and they would be stationed there. And if you married someone, your wife would come and live with you at that uh, barracks. Then my father, James, he came here in 1925. And in that short period of time, he saved enough money to go back and forth to Ireland about four or five times. And he was working as a carpenter to begin with, and then he started at McCaw Brothers, building the workbenches and so on, and worked there until then he went into uh, 
the Philadelphia Navy Yard. <clears throat> First time I went with as an infant, I went in 1937. I was just a year old, and we spent the summer at my grandfather's farm. It was a 40-acre farm near Bush Mills, Ireland. 1919, 1920, 21, when they, the Irish were being drafted into or talked to going into the uh, British Army. And the British Army during World War II sent most of them over into Turkey. And uh, they were being slaughtered over there because they really didn't have good leadership in the British Army. So the Irish said, it's better to die neath an Irish sky than at Sula or Kulabar, which was over in Turkey. They said, it's better to fight, we'll get rid of the, push the English out of Ireland. And that happened in 1921 when they partitioned off Northern Ireland, the six Northern counties in Ireland. And you know, the whole family grew up during those troubled times. And even to today, when I go over to visit relatives, if we go out somewhere, they want to get home by dark. And that's, you pretty much had to be home during the troubles when the sun went down, because that's when they, all the uh, troubles started. There was actually armed groups of men that went around and fought the English because the English army was in, they were even there when uh, my first trip back with my dad was in 1956. And we stayed for, uh, I think, three weeks. And uh, there were still uh, British troops going, walking around in town all the time. And uh, they had a vehicle they called the Pig. It was an armored uh, Land Rover. That that's how they traveled around over there. We lived in Holmes, Pennsylvania, till 1947, and a doctor had uh, suggested my dad move to a warmer climate. He couldn't he couldn't lift his uh, arms above his his uh, head. He had arthritis in his shoulders, so he said if it would be good for you to move to a warm, dry climate. So we packed up, and a cousin that my dad came to the United States with was Alec McCurdy, and he lived in Los Angeles, so that's where we ended up going to. And that was in 1947, and we had a, a Studebaker pickup truck and a two-and-a-half-ton Studebaker box van that they used for delivering the... Uh, storm windows. So my dad set that up and we packed up and headed for, we, I remember we went back out to Harrisburg to take care of some legal paperwork on the vehicles or something before we headed to California. And then we went across Highway 66. And we would stop at night. We would occasionally go to a, it was like a three or four day trip at that time. And we would, uh, I think we stopped twice at motels. They built a, over the cab, he built a, 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 a place you could crawl up in there and it was a set out front and it had windows in the front of it. There, that's where we, the kids could ride up there. And then we'd sleep up there at night too. The top speed you could probably get to was about 45, 50 miles an hour. And it was a concrete highway, I remember that. And, uh, you know, we went through Gallup, New Mexico, I remember that. And uh, I, think we, I think we went through St. Louis, but that's a long time ago. Well, it didn't help him right away. He went to work as a carpenter out there. And he, was, he ended up working most of the time in Beverly Hills because he was really a, really a skilled carpenter. And I remember he used to play uh, checkers with a retired beekeeper from Colorado named George Culver. And uh, my dad was complaining about his shoulders one time and, and George says, James, what you need is some bee stings. So the next thing you know, we have 
they they started and they took a, a swarm of bees that had settled in a in a Quonset hut in a church, and they went over there and they removed it and put it into a hive, which is frames and and uh, for the combs for the bees to store their honey on and raise their young. And the next thing you know, we've got 26 hives of bees in the backyard, which the neighbors didn't like. So from that, it just kept growing and growing. But my father, until the day he died, he could put his hands clean over his head. I mean, it really, the bee stings really helped his arthritis. Bees, when they sting you, they have a, it's a sack with a stinger on the end of it. And there's two barbs that work like this. And if when they sting you, and they only do that in self-defense because when they sting you, the barb hooks on and it pulls that sack out of the bee and it damages the bee enough that it kills them. Bees only live for about six weeks on average anyway. And it's a formic acid is the active material in the bee sting and it affects the tissue, it makes the tissue swell up and increases circulation. And some way it dissolves the arthritic buildup. And if you go to a holistic healer, they will, if you have arthritis, they usually have bees on their, their offices or they'll bring them in and they'll actually sting the areas where you have arthritis, like in your shoulders or elbows or hands. My younger brother, uh, John Charles, He's hypersensitive to bee stings. He goes into anaphylactic shock when he gets stung. And that was really hard when we were growing up and we were we had the extracting plant in the garage when we first started out. And then we built a storage my dad built a storage unit on the back of the uh, main garage and we used to extract honey and then we had the tanks and the that the honey was pumped into to let it settle out, and then we'd put it in five gallon cans. And then that would go down, ship, ship it down to the wholesalers, Western Commerce, or Superior Honey Company in Los Angeles. Then later on, as I got into the business, and we moved to Thousand Oaks, and we had a regular uh, warehouse out there that we extracted the honey in and did our repair work on the bee equipment, and then we had a storage unit down in Camarillo. There was an old barn that we used to put the bee equipment in in the wintertime when you weren't using uh, the extra, extra supers you needed when they were producing honey. I sold the last of the bee equipment because I went into the bee, I took over the bees when my dad retired. I was working on the fire department. I joined the fire department in 19, 1959. <clears throat> and I'd work on the fire department. We, used, we worked 24 hour shifts, 24 on, 24 off. And we did that for three series and then we were off for three days. So I had spare time that I started with 800 colonies of bees I got from my father and I would do that on my days off. When I was working full time with my in the bee business, at one time we had in the almonds we hauled 5,300 colonies in to, to pollinate the almond crop. We used to start hauling in about the 10th of February, and they'd be in the in the almonds for about six weeks during the almond bloom, and then we'd start hauling them, getting them out before they started spraying the pesticides on the trees. And they have a language. They talk to each other, and they have a way of, when they find a nectar source or a honey source, they'll come back to the hive, and they do what they call the honey dance. And they vibrate, and they turn around, and it's... They scientifically have studied it and learned how to decipher where they're telling each other other bees to go. So when they come back and they transmit the information to the other bees, then the worker force will go out and go to that honey source. 
grew up, I had an older sister and brother. James was the oldest. He was born in 1930. My older sister, Jean, was born in 1933. And I was born in 1936. My younger brother, John, was born in 1942. And my sister, Mary, was born in 1944. Well, my older brother and sister have both passed on. And I still have a younger brother and sister, which I usually talk to every couple of weeks. So they're both in living in California. Mary lives at a town called Ion, which is east. It's between uh, uh, Stockton and Sutter Creek. And then my younger brother, he lives outside of Los Angeles at Valencia. It's right near Magic Mountain. <laughs> when we were growing up, we had, uh, the, uh, had an empty lot next door to our house, and we used to raise all kinds of uh, vegetables in that garden. We had a huge, what they called victory gardens in those days, because everyone was encouraged to grow their own food then because most everything was being shipped overseas to feed the troops. Everybody was at that time was doing whatever they could. It was a nationwide effort to win the war in Europe and Japan or in the Far East. We as kids, we used to go around and we'd look for empty cigarette packages and they had a liner inside them to keep the cigarettes fresh. It was made out of aluminum. And we used to peel that off and make it into balls and take it in for a collection of aluminum. We're making airplanes. After the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, he was out with my brothers and sister, and he ran into a fellow from the, uh, he was from the draft board, and he told him, he said, James, you need to get into defense work. He says, otherwise we're gonna draft you. He says, they're running out of men. He says, well, I have three kids. He says, it doesn't matter. He says, they're still drafting. So that's when he went in and he worked at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and he worked on building the Wisconsin battleship and he worked there until probably 1945, 46. And uh, then he set up a business of installing uh, storm windows all over the East Coast. Growing up, <clears throat> starting in, uh, in Pennsylvania, at the, uh, it was Ridley Township school district and we went to the elementary school that was about two miles from our home and we used to walk to school. <clears throat> no buses at the, in those days. I enjoyed the baseball growing up. Remember the jungle gyms that they had there? And the school was a one-story brick building and uh, my first teacher that I remember was named Haney. And uh, I remember John Peacock was one of the guys I went to school with, Alfred White, and he had an older brother, Billy White. They lived uh, about two houses down from where we lived in Holmes. I've always liked math. I was not good at spelling or geography, and I liked geography too, was studying in foreign countries. Junior high school was a new, in 1949, they built a new high school in Reseda, and they named it John A. Sutter, and we were the first class that went through. We came in there in the seventh, seventh grade or eighth grade. Anyway, we went through there, and then from there, when I graduated from uh, Sutter, we went over, that's when I went to Canoga Park High School. I was in did gym, gymnastics. I lettered in gymnastics and uh, also ran track. I ran cross country, and that was two mile races. I did long horse and uh, side horse. It's a long, padded, 
thing about 18 inches wide and about, I think it was about three feet long. And it has two handles on the top and you mount on those handles and then you, you swing your body up and around it and doing, doing different calisthenics on it. And then when you finish, you swing off and land on the side next to it and you calm down and then come to attention. That's the end of your routine. The long horse is, is a uh, long horse and you run to it and you hit your hands on it. You can do flips, you can do side turns, you can do all kinds of stuff. You're running and you hit it and flip over it. Canoga Park High School. It's on Topanga Boulevard at, between Van Owen and Sherman Way. And I did graduate high school, 1954, summer class. They, that time they had winter and summer classes graduating.